Tonight we look at the noble profession of ghost investigation. My guests tonight are providing a heroic service attempting to prove that death is not the end. Some of my guests have no choice. Ghosts follow them around like gate crashes at a party and as firmly as they tell the ghosts to go away, they just won't. Maybe the ghosts have even followed them here to the studio tonight. <laughs> I'm Jason Carl, I'm a ghost investigator and I've spent 11 months living in Britain's most haunted house. I'm Liz Linehan. Over the past few years, I've interviewed hundreds of ordinary people who claim to have had first-hand experience of the supernatural. I remain completely open-minded. I'm Stuart Hobson. I drive a bendy bus in Sheffield. My main passion in life is ghost hunting. I'm Tony Cornell. I'm an investigator of psychical phenomena. I started off being very sceptical, but I'm quite sure now that there's something out there. I'm Philip Wharton. I study anomalous phenomena, and in my spare time I make investigating equipment. I'm Dave Williamson. I'm a bus inspector in Sheffield, and my speciality is ghost rescue, helping ghosts to pass on to the other side. Dave, you're one of those who uh, the ghosts follow around like little puppy dogs. Not exactly followers, we invite them to come with us. Mm -hmm. That way we can help them, we calm them down, uh, whatever's happened to them. We find out who they are, what's happened to them, why they're still here, why they haven't passed on, and then eventually we get our guides to help them pass on to the next world. So at first, do the ghosts not want to come with you? Are they reluctant to come? Sometimes, some are a little unsure, very often, un uh, very, very often frightened in some senses. Mm -hmm. They frighten the us. They've been around possibly some for two or three hundred years. And uh, they've tried to talk to people. Often why you get poltergeist activity, they're saying, I am here. See me, talk to me. I'm wanting help. Mm -hmm. We go in, suddenly say, oh, hello, we've got a ghost here. But uh, who are you? First thing you go, <coughs> fear. That's the first thing they see. That the ghosts are scared. The what ghosts are actually scared of us mm. because they finally, after all this time, find somebody who's actually talking to them. So how do you finally convince them to come? It's something that we've had to learn. Each individual case we go on is different. We've had um, all sorts of different people of different religions, etc. And uh, each one is different. And very often we are prompted by our spirit guides to say the right thing to them. Like? Well, for example, we did uh, the Stockbridge Bypass. That was haunted by a monk. Now, for several years since they built the bypass, there was an, an accident every two months, at least. Very often fatal. People have experienced the shape or the ghost of a monk appearing in the car. Or they've seen him walking along the bypass. He's been on Strange But True. And uh, two policemen, and two security guards were absolutely terrified. Two policemen actually had to have six months off work after. We formed an organisation that, well, we were a charity stunt. We just went out to see what we could see. I ended up actually talking to the monk, calming him down. Wasn't it with one side of me saying, we're only here to help. And eventually, I was walking up the lane to where I knew this monk were. And a little voice says to me, mention God. Of course, what a fool I've been. He's a religious person, and as soon as I mentioned God, he calmed. And he said, I thought you were witches coming to send me to hell. You're exorcising, really, aren't you? A form yeah. of exorcising, but yeah. we don't call it exercise. No, no. Exercise, it, the church calls it exorcism. Mm -hmm. We yeah. call it soul rescue. Can I ask you, do you think Certainly. you're exorcising the, the actual ghost, mm -hmm. or do you think you're exorcising the minds of the people who see it? Good question. Um, I should say no, because we actually, I actually see the ghost itself. Right. I actually see the person who is the. Uh, we go in, and I can actually see the person. I'll describe the person, mm -hmm. who it is, mm -hmm. and I'll say, 
Did your mother, for an example, did your mother have, um, did she wear a little hat? Did she have a long dress and stuff mm. like that? Mm. A bit of clairvoyance type of thing, if you like. But if she's making a nuisance of herself mm. and they wanted to go, which we actually did one, mm. the mother in one house, she wouldn't go. It was her property. Go where? Now, we pass them on to the, if you like, most people call it heaven. Mm. For the want of a better word, we call it the spirit world. And it's uh, a place the there's the known light. Everybody speaks about the light. It is a bright light. It does appear. Mm. And it is, you can look at it, and it's very bright, yet it doesn't actually hurt your eyes. Mm -hmm. And once they've passed through that world, through that light, the into the next world, where everything's basically hunky-dory, if you like. Mm. And they don't want to go in the first place because they're in a situation where, when alive, they felt comfortable, and so they don't want to leave Exactly. It. Sometimes they may have been shocked out of the body, a bit like the film Ghost. Mm -hmm. He was killed. He didn't realise he was even dead. Mm. Some people we've had uh, are so evil in their own way, in their own lives, that they go towards the light, and what, what they actually see is their own evils reflected back on them and therefore they don't cross. They think they go into hell. Mm. But then they create their own hell by staying in limbo. It's like looking through a two-way mirror. They can see us, and they're, 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 yet they're still in their own world. Their own world is there. So basically, the ghosts who are, who are more happy when they're alive, the ones who live in a nice flat or whatever, mm -hmm. are less likely to go to heaven when they die, they're more likely to stay in the situation where they're, where they're Only comfortable. Only occasionally. It's not everyone. I mean, the mid, shall we say, out of a thousand people that die, a thousand people will go to heaven. But out of a million, it'll probably be one that doesn't, for some reason or another. He might say, um, I'm her father. And before I went, I have forgot to pass this message. I forgot to say, I love you or something stupid like that, which has happened. Mm. Until he can say, he can't pass. And that's uh, why you have seances then, to, to pass the messages on so that the ghosts are ready to... Very often, yeah. Onwards. But our seances are mainly development circles to help people who wish to build the psychic um, powers mm. or wish even proof. Did They're a few of you have a seance last night? I know you were going to, or did yes, you just we did. decide not to? You did? <laughs> Our group did. I'm sorry, it's me again, yeah. Uh, and, and, and this was to possibly bring some ghosts with you to the, to the studio? Uh, not exactly, no. It was just a, a development circle, and uh, one of the two people at work who are interested in ghosts mm. wish to come along and just have a discussion about ghosts, basically. And, of course, there are some areas where you can't move for ghosts. For instance, Jason, didn't you live in um, one of Britain's most haunted houses? Shingle Hall in Lancashire last year, yeah. yeah. Mm. And there are 20... 21 different ghosts reportedly there and literally scores of people hundreds and hundreds of people go there to see the ghosts uh, some skeptical some believers some expecting to see something and know what they're expecting to see others not knowing anything at all and they seem to see the same things and have the same kind of experiences again and again and again and i living there for 11 years saw and experienced many many different hundreds of different things but I don't believe myself to be psychic. I don't know if you believe you are psychic or if ghosts are attracted to you particularly. I don't believe that I'm psychic or that I'm special or that I have any powers um, any, uh, as any other person would have. I don't believe that I'm special in any way. It's just that certain people are in a certain place at a certain time when the ghost seems to manifest. And certainly in some places like Chingle Hall, that seems to happen very regularly, possibly because of the location rather than the people. I mean, Chingle Hall, for example, is built on a double ley line crossing. Um, and ley lines supposedly do tend to attract supernatural activity and certainly poltergeist activity, ghosts being seen and sounds do happen on ley lines and particularly at that place. You started off as a, as a skeptic, didn't you, Tony? And yes, I did. Uh, at the age of 14, I was at a school in Cambridge where everything was scientifically orientated and I thought you could explain everything by science. And I uh, had an argument with um, the local boys. They were saying, oh, you know, you don't sleep in them. In the, in the local churchyard because it's haunted and I said don't be silly and I bragged about this and I had to go and sleep in this damn churchyard and I saw nothing. The most dangerous thing about it was getting out of the house at the age of 14 without my parents knowing getting back in. But when I went to India um, as a young naval officer uh, I was very still sceptical and we went to the Nilgiri Hills in uh, southern India, 6,000 feet up, all on leaf 
And I was told there was a fakir, a holy man, up on one of these mountains. So I got a taxi, and the taxi driver sat up there, and I walked up, and there's a big, flat piece of rock with a, a fissure in it. And you walk through this fissure, and you came out onto a big, flat piece of rock overlooking the steaming plain 6,000 feet down, 5,000 feet. And here was this old man, about 70 on, in a brown toga, making tea on a paraffin stove. And he knew I was there, and I was a cocky little devil. I mean, I really was. I got my commission up here, and he looked at me, and I think he got me weighed up pretty well, and he said, um, want some tea? I said, oh, no, you know, no time for tea. So he said, um, well, I suppose you've come up here for me to entertain you. And he got me weighed up. He said, you're very material. I can see that. It's no good me talking about spirituality with you. But it's a long way up. I'll cut the story short. Mm. Long way up. Can I just one thing? Because I was sorry. Right. Was he alive or dead? No, he's alive. Oh, right. He's alive. I'm pretty sure so, anyway. But <laughs> he may not have been when you hear the end of the story. Anyway, he, he gave me a lecture and said, now, look, I'm not going to waste my time with you, but you, it's a long walk. Look over the hills, my son. He's standing here, and I thought, well, I've had one lecture. Look over the hills, he says. You will not see, uh, find wisdom at your feet. And I thought, oh, my God. Look over the hills. So I better look over the hills. I get another lecture, and he's standing here, and I'm looking over the hills, and I think, this, this felt odd. Turn, he's not there. And I can't see him. I don't know where the hell he's got to. Pole vault, where? What, you see? And he's the other side of a stream that's coming out from another fissure for higher up at 30 degrees, streaming down. I was very fit. I was a boxer. I couldn't get across there. And he's standing looking at me, smiling. The whole of the toga is brown, no water stains anywhere. I start walking towards him. He points to the hills again, you see, smiling. I still walk and points to the hill. I've done about five yards, five, five paces, that's all. He's about 30 paces away. So I, I think, well, I look, what the heck's going on here? And the voice says, now, my son, how about that? Would you like some tea? I said, oh, yes, please. <laughs> and I went down that hill, not quite so cocky as I came up it. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't work it out at all, because there was no accomplice of any nature at all. And that shook me. And I thought, there's something in this subject. Oh, well, the boys, when I got back in, in, in the squadron, said, oh, I hallucinated, Tony, you know, a sunstroke. But it wasn't that. And I've been looking at it now 50 years, and there is something in the subject that is very worthy of investigation. One of, the, one of our researchers who's uh, been in it the longest, who's done a lot of investigations into some very serious cases, and some very good work, and he's uh, quite a sceptical chap, um, at the end of a vigil, when we do a, a proper vigil, everything's written down, everybody's in groups of two except or more, and uh, if you cough or sneeze, you write it down so that another group can you know, verify that that was the noise they heard. You know, bus screeched to halt one side, the group's mm. got down, scream at the other side, well, you can cross it out because it's the same time. And at the end, you'll often say, come on, is there anything else? No, no, no. And this particular person, called him Dave, um, uh, very sheepish looking, fits in, and he says, yeah, well, there was something. It was, what, what? well, while I was on the stairs, I'm sure I saw the <coughs> silhouette of a, of a rabbit go past. So we took, I mean, the next committee meeting, he was given a carrot and <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, the very next vigil that was done at this particular place, um, we had a, a total novice group. Um, they, they knew nothing. They'd just come onto the scene. They knew nothing about it. And the, kept, the rabbit bit had been kept quite quiet. And at the end, again, you know, anything else. And yeah, well, we've written down here on the stairs we had and it was exactly the same spot, and this is months later, a small animal go past, <laughs> maybe a rabbit, and Dave's face lit up, and the rest of us went, oh. <laughs> so, so um, you now the actual place was uh, 1400s, and, and there were rabbit warrens in the grounds, and rabbit was quite a, a, well, you'd, an important... Uh, yeah. Well, you'd think that you get a lot of ghost rabbits, because you're saying that a lot of ghosts come from... from people which die very suddenly and rabbits are constantly dying suddenly <laughs> and running them over every <laughs> ten minutes. Yeah. Actually there's a lovely story about a white rabbit uh, in a very old book I've got. I can't quote the, the name of the book, it's well known. But uh, this was a haunted house and it wasn't lived in for a very long time. People went in and, and get out three months later. All I know is it's, it's named as number eight and it, it, it goes back to 1840. But it's a lovely story. And apparently uh, a mother eventually took residence in this place and she had six children. And uh, there's a lovely story about suddenly they'd be having dinner and they'd suddenly see this white rabbit and they'd try and catch it and they're upsetting the chairs and doing this, just tearing here and tearing there. And it would disappear through the wall. 
and it's mm. seen several times apparently. So it's animals as well, to say. Mm. Now we've been we've been talking only about uh, benevolent ghosts, but of course, well, you you were you were pushed up the stairs by a ghost, weren't you? Yes, at Chillingham Castle when we uh, did an all-night vigil last September. Mm. Um, pushed you all the way up? No, it was a more of a just a shove, and I turned round to uh, have a word with the person that was so silly to push me to try and frighten me. There was nobody there. The rest of the group were quite a way down the stairs. There's no way they could have pushed me and run back down the stairs. One of the many things that happened to me at Chingle Hall before I actually lived there, when I'd actually visited it for a week, happened um, late autumn one afternoon. I was there with one friend of mine and it has two entrances, the main entrance and the back door. The main entrance is a very old 10th century door, the back door is a normal modern one which was locked. Mm. Anyway, we were on the drawbridge just outside the main front door and the door was open. It's got a very big old metal iron catch um, and the door was, was latched over with the catch and there's a very big iron bolt that shoves across to lock the door. There's no modern lock on it. Anyway, we stood outside, there was no one in the house, no one else around and suddenly the, the bolt just shot across. It, we heard it move. It wasn't a very loud noise, but I couldn't get back in the door. My keys were inside, the keys that I was borrowing, uh, and the back door was locked, as I said, and so we had to actually break in, if you like, to the house. But luckily, one of the upstairs windows was slightly ajar, and so with the help of a ladder, we did manage to get in. But a lot of people would describe that experience as being benevolent, almost as if the ghost didn't want us to get back into the house, but I don't think it was. I think it was having a joke. I think a lot of spirits have a sense <coughs> of humour and that they interact with you in a, a comical way, if you like. And, and for example, your shove at Chillingham Castle, where I've also been, I would say that that is not necessarily benevolent, but almost to say hello, if you like, to say, yes, I'm here, yeah, yeah, not sure. necessarily evil or nasty. Mm. Yep. I think we ought to get on record that if you look at all the, the stuff that the, the society I'm attached to has uh, investigated over the years and all the files, and uh, you'll find that nobody has ever had any serious damage done to them by a ghost. That belongs to the fiction writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't. So, I mean, uh, one of the things we have to do, you two, we all do, when we go into these places, is calm people down. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always tell them is, look, I don't know of any case where anybody has ever been had any damage done to them. Except for the poisoning at the turn of the Except century. Except for? The poisoning at the turn of the century. <laughs> yes. There was, there was the case of the poisoning. Well, I, I, I leave that one alone. Oh, well, what, <laughs> ghosts were poisoning people? No, it was, it was, it was reported. Well, that was the alleged story. It was the alleged story that the yes. ghost was reporting. What actually we think happened was that um, the, uh, the daughter was being interfered with by the father and he died of poisoning. Now, in those days, there was death penalty or death penalty. Mm. So the, I think it is recorded that uh, because there was alleged poltergeist activity and etc., mm. and obviously the, the authorities could see through what was going on, it was put down to um, perhaps the poltergeist. And nobody it? was ever... Uh... No. no. So, uh, but seriously, no, there is no actual recorded um, harm. A lot of things, you see, I have a, a different view on, on this from I think most um, in that I would say that a lot of this is much more human. It is, it is a human manifestation. The, the sense of humour is a sense of humour. It's a human sense of humour. Well people forget that, that ghosts are people too. Yeah. But it's more living human than dead human. Um, but yeah, and that, that it's actually more to do with the living people that are around and things. You're saying it's people playing tricks on each other? No, not tricks like that, like, you know, obviously When you say it's a human fraudulent. manifestation, how would you explain the example that I just gave where an actual, a door with a big, mm. enormous metal lock actually locked itself when there's no one in the house? Well, how would you explain that I, within I, the... Um, I can't, but another explanation that a lot of people would come up with is psychokinesis, the ability of the mind PK. to move matter, mm. PK. So I wanted um, to lock myself out of the house. To no, not actually been trying to drop you a hint. Not necessarily, and, and it doesn't mean that it <laughs> was you. Dropping you hints all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't mean it was you. It could be, could be anyone. In a lot of cases that we we studied, there there tends to be a focus, a person that's living, that's a focus, especially in poltergeist. I think hauntings have to be dealt separately, where you, you're seeing something from the past, as yeah. it were. But a lot of the the movement ones, we would tend to say, a, a focus of the of the human, the human kind, um, and a lot of those plates and all that sort of thing, it's almost like an argument going on. I know a lot of people have reported, um, I mean, you have a blazing row, you know, your girlfriend or whatever has, has just, you know, really upset you. You don't mean to hit them with the plate or the saucepan. Well, you shouldn't. Uh, you, yeah, <laughs> whatever. I don't hit them with the plate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. You just don't mean to be there. Yeah, you just don't mean to be there. No, no, no. Yeah. Even, no. <laughs> 
No, but you know, I've never hit anybody with either a plate. Or exactly, or a plate and neither is a poltergeist. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like it's like an argument and yeah. chucking something. You don't mean to hit them. You're aiming to the side. That's it's right. making a point, and it's it's this making a point. You know, this yeah. I don't know what he's locking him out for. Mm. <laughs> Do know what you've done. <laughs> well, Liz, you've been a bit of a ghostly figure for the last with your nice silver ghostly blouse on and everything. You come very much from the folklore tradition, don't you? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I do go out on overnight vigils, uh, like most of the people here, with certain equipment um, to try and record anything that may happen during the course of the night. But my particular interest is actually um, why people believe in something else, why people believe in old legends like the Black Dog, for example, um, what people actually think of poltergeists and why they believe that they can possibly communicate with dead people, either known to them or not known to them. Mm. And what have you come up with? Uh, well, I've um, probably got many, many more years of collecting data and uh, interviews with people to actually um, go through before I can, I can draw any conclusions at all. Mm. Um, but um, what interests me is that a lot of the people I've spoken to have done a lot of uh, work in the north of England, especially in South Yorkshire where I live. And I'm always fascinated by how many down-to-earth people can tell stories about something they've seen or experienced and then qualify it by saying, and of course I don't believe in ghosts, you know, I don't care what's happened to me, but I still don't believe. Um, yeah. 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 My mother, in fact, is sort of a ghostly figure and doesn't believe in ghosts. Mm. And, I, and maybe I should put on the record at this point, my ghostly experience, which I did have, was... Um, I went to a, when I was a very young child, and I was going to actually ask about the poltergeist because they, they always say that it's a manifestation of, of disturbed children. Um, and no, no, no. No. We've done a, a survey, 500 cases. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, Alan Gould, and we published it well about 1979, and there's no one common denominator in a poltergeist activity. Mm -hmm. Lots of people say it's children at the age of puberty, but I mean, there are lots of families where there are children, mm -hmm. but there's no one common denominator we can find anywhere at all. I think stress has got to be... Mm -hmm. uh, the one that we found is stress, mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think um, children often get the blame, but we've also found that um, people before and after moving house, like six months either side, um, breakups, you know, just divorced, whatever, and mm. retirement, when, you know, for all these years you've been going to the job, the same job, and then suddenly your routine changes, mm. and a lot of people who have retired seem to, to, to say they've got poltergeist activity. Yeah, well, you exactly. were saying just then about people moving houses, mm. and that was a cause of stress. I would say that rather, when people move a house, you often find that if a house has a reputation for being haunted, then that is when the haunting or the poltergeist issue, whatever it is that's occurring, occurs. And I personally, one of the houses that I grew up in, in Oxfordshire when I moved in, although I was very young, things did happen. And it seems to me that when people move into a new house, although that may be a stressful situation, it's not to do with the stress, it's more to do with the ghost accepting the new people into the house or not as the case may be. And that's mm -hmm. why it's Even, active. Um, in a case where you get people who've lived in a certain house for a long time, it may have a great history attached to it. And if they try and perform any alterations in yeah. that house, ah, for some reason yeah, that sparks yeah. off yeah. activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alterations, that comes up a lot. I've done about 800 cases investigating various things over the years and that point comes up a lot. Mm. When they start altering the inside of the house, then things happen. Yeah. We, we, we don't get, know why. We just I'm buying a house windows, next week and we're going to get it well, altered. Well, don't start altering it. <laughs> well, we are. <laughs> the builders are booked and now I'm well, scared. We're going to get a ghost. <laughs> i tell you my... Um, well, well, come on, clear let's clear. hear your story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I mean, very, I've, I've never... I'd, 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 it's a very nervous moment. I think my ghost experience was a uh, very young child on holiday in, in um, the New Forest when, when I was a kid, and, and I went to bed. Um, and it was a, it was an old house, no TV, no radio. So I checked the next day, and as I put my head on the pillow, I heard a party going on downstairs. Although we were the only family in the whole in the whole hotel, and I heard this party talking and laughing and chatting and so on. And um, I went downstairs the next morning, and I said, "Did you have a party?" last night and they said no and um, I said well did you have a radio on but perhaps there was a party mm. being broadcast on the radio mm. obviously mm. I couldn't think of any particular radio program which would just broadcast a party because that would be very dull radio no, anyway but to cut a long story short they said no they said what you heard I assume was a ghost party and there was a history of it was it I never <laughs> asked I don't know no I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I, I but a whole party, <laughs> I mean, a house. So I yeah. had a house full of people chattering about and making yeah. jokes. And it was only when oh, I put my head to the pillow. When I took my head mm. away from the pillow, there was nothing. So and it you wasn't were perfectly a... sane and normal person. Yeah, yeah. It, was <laughs> no, it wasn't a party in my head, <laughs> sir. 
because of course you're out of the group because most of the most of the people in the group here are, you seem to be pretty much uncategorical believers but you were telling me before you were showing me photos saying ah that was a that was well, a, some of the photographs that like this one see, yes this that, is that's, the that's very early that's 1923 and, and um, in, in those days people would go along to a psychic photo photographer uh -huh. right <clears throat> and they'd sit and have a portrait taken mm -hmm. with the idea of getting a spirit uh, extra on the photograph afterwards. Ah. Uh, there's a chap called Hope in Crew. There are quite a number. Well, there's between. a lot, because this one's got Shakespeare behind. Something like <laughs> that. Or a Shakespeare type. Mm. And a lot of this stuff was fake, you see. Yeah. Mm. And uh, it was done by double exposure. And uh, I mean, it was shown to be the case, but there are lots of people who still believe in this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this and was a trend in the 20s. You'd think was. they'd be reacting more, wouldn't you? You'd yeah. think they'd be looking behind going, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, we actually have photographs that, well, shall we say, we think are ghosts. Mm. In fact, have you, yeah, please. Well, we uh, believe, uh, I'll put it this way, uh, that these are the photographs that I was moving about. Oh. Not poltergeist activity, it's just mm -hmm. slipping. These were taken on a clear night mm -hmm. back in April 1995. Mm -hmm. There was no mist, there was no fog, there were no cars to cause exhaust. But here is the cowl and the shape of the Stocksbridge monk. Now if you look at this picture, we've also got the same cowl, the same part of the body. Two different pictures, exactly the same shape or bar that little bit, near as damn it. That way is facing that way, that way is facing that way. And Could you uh, take them out, let us look at them all? Certainly that's no problem. Mind. There's also a magnifying glass if anybody wants to. How can you see, Tony? It's supposed to be the most sceptical of the group. Well, no, if I may I'm just well, add before he. I, I want to be balanced, mm -hmm. you see. And you see, yep. to, to me, with great respect, I can't make that a boy at all. It looks. Ah, oh, what, the whole Where? thing's the figure? There's the nose, there's the mouth, there's the eyes. Is that yeah. what you're There's say? another one as well. Like a yep. big, like a kind of cat like figure. Oh, here, you mean the eyes there, like that? No, no, no eyes there. Right. You see, this is one of the inherent dangers of... Yeah. Well, this is... That's right. You can mm. see... You, you, everybody you can, sees something yeah. different. Because yeah. I've got a big sort of lion-like thing with, with spittle coming out of his mouth. <laughs> ear there and ear there. And... You're using your imagination. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I really mean it. That's this, quite possible. No, that's that's, that's quite possible. Glass. But on the whole, <laughs> what is it? No, no, good it's a question. What is it? Could it be? Could it be? It's only what you're we no fool, you know we camera. believe. What is it? It's I, a ghost. Quite, I quite agree. We don't know what it is. Yeah. What do you make of it? I was going to say, could it, it be the breath? Could it be that you've caught? You're exhaling, no, which you wouldn't ne necessarily see. But the the flash, uh, this, we do yeah, have that. The photographer the exhaling. Yes. Yeah, that's the shrub. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, we do have some of it, but then again, you couldn't see your breath on that thing. Yeah. It wasn't cold enough to feel yeah, your breath. Yeah, sure. Well, that, that you can't was see it in, in, in the normal the light, but the, oh, the I, instantaneous I flash on the light. photograph, but I've got an untrained eye. Of actually somebody blowing smoke. Just as a comparison. I was gonna, well, if, well, if we can yeah. change the subject a little bit, something which, which I know virtually nothing about, which I find exciting and, and a little bit nerve-wracking, is the notion of doppelgangers. Ah, yeah. The idea there's two... I mean, yeah. who, 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 who's the doppelganger? I don't know well, about this, but somebody saw mine once. Really? Now, this is a true story. When I was around perhaps 16, 17, um, I was meeting a friend of mine in town, in a middle England town in Banbury. Mm. Um, and I was actually walking around the town before I was to meet him. And uh, he saw my father's car with me in it go past. Mm -hmm. And he wanted where I was going, so he telephoned my house and said, where's Jason going? I was just seeing him go past in the car. And actually my dad answered the phone and he was quite surprised that he had seen our car with my father and me. Now, it's all very well to say that someone would have looked like me or it would have been the same car or it would have been someone that was similar full stop in the same place, but it wasn't. I mean, you can't have those three different factors, the car, me and my father, in a place where we weren't. Mm -hmm. My father was at home, mm -hmm. the car was at home, and I was in the town walking round. Mm -hmm. And yet he had seen exactly me, so convinced that he had, had called home to see why, why I wasn't meeting him. Mm. And she, also there's a, there's a case in a school where the, where the um, teacher was in the playground right. and teaching at the same time? Yeah, no, that's, that, that's uh, another one similar to this. Mm -hmm. you, you probably know it. The t school teacher looked at her record. She went from school to school to school, and you think, my God, she was a bad teacher. Mm -hmm. She wasn't. The situation simply was she's sitting at the desk like this, and the mm -hmm. kids are all looking at her. 
and then they start laughing and she knows why because they're laughing and looking out uh, into the play playground and they see her mm. and when she turns or turned past tense to look at herself the thing disappeared headmaster <laughs> would see her running up and down the gangway so oh, what, what are you doing you should be in your classroom she wasn't <coughs> so they'd suck her for this no mm. uh, it got so uncomfortable that they would say well you think you, you know you ought to, to carry on I mean this was happening uh, uh, quite often usually the now the... when she got married it all stopped right. for some unknown reason you'll never see your own doppelganger well she never the, the, the teacher never did she knew when she turned to look at herself she'd never see it mm. there's another one uh, of two people walking down uh, I think it was Bridlington walking down uh, the pavement and they saw a chap who they, they lived in the town and uh, had gone to Australia and said, hi Bill, and he waved back to them and they walked on and said, well he must have come back and said, oh, when do you think he came back, that was it he was still in Australia <laughs> Show you. Oh, bring these out. I was asked to bring this. Oh, some, some of the equipment. Yeah. Good. Well, we've got some night vision equipment, which we can't use here because it's too bright. But we'll what we've tried to do is burn it out. We've tried to actually see if if anyone sees anything. Mm. If you use the night vision equipment, does it amplify it? Is it in the mind mm. so that you'd see the same thing, or does it amplify it? This is the basic stuff. <clears throat> now I've got a little towel on on night vision. We, uh, we were doing an investigation in a pub some years ago. There's, some, there's a pair of binoculars. And this is the sort of thing I mean. And I'll just show this here. This is uh, the sort of thing I mean. Mm. All it, it's not infrared, it just amplifies the light that you see around. Mm. So, um, you know, with the smallest of light, you can see quite a lot. And um, a colleague of mine, we'd had some very strange glowing yellow, uh, green lights. Mm. And this was in a pub. And we couldn't work out what it was. Spirits it wasn't bright enough. Pub. Spirits in the pub, yeah, all the old jokes. <laughs> and uh, well, it, well, what it was was it's actually the glow from the LEDs and a cash register. We'd asked them to switch everything out, mm -hmm. and it was now well, hang on, hang on, and it was reflecting off of there onto the optics. Mm. So it's ever so faint. Now with this, no problem. Looks through, works out what it is. We're all standing behind Tony, and this is actually recorded on a cassette tape, which we still got to this day. It's just. No problem, we've solved it, no problem. And we were there all night. There have been qu quite a few noises. And then Tony goes, will you please get out of the way? Will you get out of the way? Because someone's in front. Now, we're talking closer than you and me. We're talking someone about here. And there's this pause where everybody behind goes, Tony, we're all behind you. And it's like, oh. And at that moment, I actually saw a silhouette going up the stairs outside. There was a very small light there, and we could act... I, was the only one who actually saw the, the silhouette, but the others noticed that it was a light difference. But I was looking that way, and there's this like cartoon cutout pair of black legs run up the stairs. Very strange. Um, and so the equipment wasn't lying. You know, there was something in his way that was cutting the light out in front of us. So it's not all psychological. No, it's not. And you've it, also, um, you've taped, uh, you've got a ghostly dawn up on tape. Yeah, that's right. Um, last summer, um, I'd gone to interview uh, a family who live in a, a house that's um, believed to be haunted and um, I always take a dictaphone with me because I don't take shorthand and when I interview people I like to get as accurate a, a story as I can and I, I spent almost the whole of the day with this particular family and at one point we were sat in the lounge which is about the size of this studio and I had the dictaphone running there were four of us in the room we were sat around very much like we are now and I was you know asking them questions about the haunting uh, kind of activity that they'd been they identified it as a, a grey lady so they believed who'd been a former member of the household in the 1700s and the lady who owned the house um, stood up and excused herself quite suddenly and, and said you know there's somebody at the door I'll, I'll be back in a second so we carried on chatting and I left the dictaphone sort of on the arm of the chair really and um, the lady around the house came back in and was very puzzled because she said there's, there's nobody at the door, I, I can't understand it. 
And at that point, we said, well, you know, we didn't hear anything anyway. It's quite interesting that, that there were four of us all in all and three of us seated in the room hadn't heard a thing. Now, she said that she'd quite clearly heard two very loud raps on wood mm. and that's why she'd gone out to answer the door. Where her front door is, it's actually in a country estate that's flat. You can see for miles there wasn't any question of anybody being there. And the following day when I actually came to playing back the interview, and typing up the notes, there was indeed two very loud mm. knocks on wood prior to this lady standing. I cut it all on tape and saying, oh, excuse me, there's somebody at the door. Now, the thing was that because my dictaphone was on such slow speed, you it literally it sounded as though it was right mm. next to it, something had knocked next mm. to it. It wouldn't, it shouldn't have picked it up. Mm. And the front door itself was, was at least another wall and a corridor away. It wasn't in the same room. Yeah. I've, I've uh, it sounds a very strange one in in a lot of the hauntings. I've got two two little ones on that. One was um, Dover Castle, which we did quite a lot on. In fact, people have seen the, the video with the shaking doors. It was yeah. Assad that actually actually caught that, and they weren't they weren't looking for the door shaking. They were looking for something totally different. It just happened. But um, I was actually on a on a vigil there, and um, I actually heard a door open that wasn't there. Um, it, a lot of the castle's been altered and they'd taken out one of the doors. And it was really annoying because the door was up the corridor and we had all this equipment. Now, we've got, uh, in here we've got things um, like this, this that uh, infrared sensors and ultrasonic sensors, which yeah. will go off if anyone goes past them or touches them or whatever, to, to rule out human fraud, you know, so you know that, yeah, so you, you know that it's not someone mucking around. Right. And we had to go right the way around the castle to where it was because we would go through it. And in the end, we came back and we heard it again and it was, oh, blow it, so we went through the lot. But it was, by a doorway, but the doorway wasn't there anymore. You could see the scar of where they'd knocked it all out and all that. Now, do the ghosts know that there's equipment there? <laughs> we've do we've actually well, done And they don't want to be recorded, of course. The don't investigation that I'm linked with has a 70% success rate of something supernatural happening at every place we've been over the last six or seven years. And I've read an awful lot of investigation reports of other organisations who take an awful lot of equipment like this and who very rarely get anything. Mm. Now, you can say that a lot of things that people witness themselves is their imagination or there's some other reason for it, but not always. And when we go, human perception is much more interesting and exciting to me than finding something on a camera. Now, we have got things on cameras. Kodak have examined our photographs, as has Maurice Gross and various other people connected with the world of uh, ghost hunting and have analysed them as being... Uh, truly something you can't explain as well as videos and tapes but human experience is more interesting than that I think and 70% as I said of people that go on Argo Sons do experience something that's seeing or hearing uh, what you were talking about before with sounds as well one of the places that we went was an inn in Gloucestershire which we studied for three years continually and during one seance that we had there was no medium present but uh, there were several people holding a circle sitting down talking we hoped we'd get something responding to us. We heard nothing, no knocks, no responses, but we continued for several minutes. When we played the tape back of the seance, every question we had asked had responses to it. You could hear the knockings, and they became agitated throughout, as if it was getting angry that we couldn't hear it yet. None of us physically heard anything at the time, yet the mm. tape caught it. Well, there's I wonder the use what the... of instrumentation, yeah. Because mm. I'd really like to know kind of why. We've never, we've never really asked why you do what you do. There's why, why do you do this? What's... What do you want to find? I don't know. I honestly can't say. Um, I think you probably find that a lot of people who've been interested for years and years honestly can't say when their interest first developed, exactly why why they do it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I really don't know. I've just, there's just a fascination there, because like my um, my tape recording that I could or I may not have got um, something paranormal on tape. It's the fascination is what, uh, have I, and mm -hmm. you know what is it? It's it's the unanswered questions really. Mm -hmm. Stuart? I think, well, as with me, um, what triggered my first um, interest was my wife taking a photograph um, in uh, the churchyard where the Brontes uh, lived. Right. Um, it was just done with flash on a clear day. I, t I, t I myself took a photograph. This was taken at, in the day? In the daytime. Well, I took that photograph with no flash because I'd forgotten my flash gun with my camera. Mm. And while I was taking that of the floodlit front of the parsonage um, at Haworth, uh, my wife took that photograph with a flash of the church. She didn't realise that it wouldn't illuminate the church with it right. being quite a long way away, but that came out. Mm. We actually stood on gravestones in the graveyard. 
Did you take the photograph? Yeah. Well, you can see some of the foliage there, can't mm. you? And the, you can actually see dim, a dim outline of the gravestones. Now that mm. yeah. really impressed me, and I, I took it along to show to Dave, and um, he said yes. As far as he was concerned, there was something unnatural about that mm. photograph. Mm. There must have been there must have been some sort of belief there because if I took a photograph in, in a graveyard and it came like that came out yeah. like that, I just think oh camera didn't work. Hmm. I was wondering because both of you work in the in the bus industry and there's actually a lot of bus drivers who have had a lot of ghostly experiences in Sheffield. There've been ghostly buses there, one in London. Isn't well, I was going to ask because if you're a ghost, yeah, and you, yeah, you yeah, can move tan you can move through tangible yeah. you know move yeah. through walls. You go. Yeah. You wouldn't want to go on public transport, would you? People, People die on buses. Mm. You you. Were, you be I've been in this. Yeah, I've been in this industry about years. 16 years, yeah. and I can remember two, three, four instances where people have called for an ambulance, and the person's actually died on the bus. Yeah. We had one bus, um, and when you was at the terminus, you could hear footsteps upstairs, <clears> and the conductor used to go upstairs. You haven't paid. Nobody there, and you could see somebody walking down the bus. And buses are, they tend to creak when you walk upstairs. You can hear. Definite footsteps. <clears throat> this bus is no longer in service, by the way. So, it's mm. well, there was one famous ghost on a particular road where uh, night drivers, in particular, would come round an island, and um, they'd see the figure of a person cross from one side of the road all the way across the road and walk into the cemetery. Now, certain drivers were absolutely terrified that they'd see this person walk across into the cemetery until somebody. Went round corner one night, stopped, and realised the headlights were shining onto a sign which cast a shadow on yeah. the road. As it went round the island, yeah. the shadow crossed and disappeared that. towards the cemetery. Mm -hmm. yeah. It were a natural phenomenon. Can I can I give you a story? And you tell me whether you think it's a ghost. I make it quick. I had I bought a dog when I was about uh, twenty odd uh, from a boy. I didn't like the look of it. I paid half a crown for it. It was christened Boozer because I had the inevitable party when my parents were away and the dog got drunk. And uh, I got very fond of this dog. It was a half-breed Labrador boxer. Harem scarum dog, but lovely dog. Bitch. Any rate, as I tended to go away from home, my mother looked more after the dog. She lasted 12 years and uh, she started getting bumps and my mother rang me up and said, no, look, you know, it's no good. We, we can't put it off anymore. We've got to put her down because she's feeling it. So I had the job to take the dog up to the veterinary college in Cambridge and uh, I put it off as much as I could. I got the dog in, in the car and I drove it all around the different villages where we used to go and let her take all the smells and this and the other. Got to the veterinary college and took her in and I said to the vet, I'm sorry, I, I just can't do it. I've got to leave you to it. And he wasn't too happy about that. But anyway, I went out and sat in the car. He came out and called me. And I went in and he was not nasty with me, but annoyed. He'd had a job with this dog. He said, you should have been here. I had quite a game putting her down. I, I said, well, why? And he said, well, I had to hold her down and put her an injection in the left leg here, you see. And she, you know, she wouldn't keep still. So I said, well, I'm sorry. Anyway, I took the dog, took it back to my mother, left the dog in the back seat, went into the house for my mother, and my mother was completely distraught. She said, how did Boozer get away? She, she got away. I said, mother, she's in the car. And my mother said, no, Tony, don't, don't pull my legs. I saw her come into the kitchen. She came into the kitchen through the door. I saw her come in. I said, no, look, mother, she's in the car. Now, it was quite clear that my mother saw this. She, she's not a woman to, to exaggerate. And she told me that the dog eventually ran out and went into the garden. She couldn't find her. Now, did my mother see the, the ghost of that dog or not? She did not know, neither did I know, how this dog was going to be put down. We were both distraught, both highly emotional, upset about this. Now, I didn't know when I went there that the dog was going to have a lethal injection in the rear leg. I only knew afterwards. Was this a tele <coughs> telepathic message from me to my mother? We were both distraught about this. Or did the dog come back and see my mother? I can't tell you. I just don't know. Well, they came back to say goodbye. Hmm. Could be. Mm -hmm. You had a four-year-old child living with you for a month, didn't you? Uh, about, no, be about 12-year-old. 12-year-old. Yeah. He, um, um, may I just point out, it was not just a new average 12-year-old child, it was a... Girl. It was uh, very deformed. It was burnt as a witch around about 14th, 15th century. He, uh, he told me, in so many words, the cows went dry. And that's all, in words. The rest I saw 
if you like... The cows went dry. The cows went dry. Now, Did you know what this meant? Yeah. Uh, which now, part? in the olden days, um, a cow used to give milk every day. This particular bloke who lived in this village, mm -hmm. he probably had two or three cows which supplied village with the milk. Uh. Now, when a cow dried up, it stopped giving milk. So, so obviously, the cows somebody. went dry, and that's all he said. Now, obviously, if something like that did happen in them days, yeah. they'd have to put the blame on somebody. Yeah. So they either put the blame on, uh, oh, it was some supernatural yeah. god that yeah. did it, or it were him, he's a witch, yeah. or she's a witch. Yeah. Yeah. And you knew all this because he'd said to you that the cows went dry. That's right, and that's all he did say. The rest of it was if he was passing his memories on to me. I saw as like a video in my mind. Everything else, say I'm looking at this room now, that would totally go blank. And all I saw was the picture of this young lad being accused of a witch, basically, and he was burnt at the stake. And I could see this stake in the middle of the floor. His arms tied behind his back, and that's all they tied, his hands. Now, as the flames burnt him, they also burnt through the ropes. And there was this pathetic screaming figure Black arms dragging himself away from fire, and another one of villagers with a pitchfork stuck it on the back of his neck and pressed his head into the sludge to suffocate him. Prodded him, chucked him back on fire, and that's how I knew he'd died. And it's all, as I say, recorded. We took him actually for the first time, we took him out to the first Saturday night he stopped with us. We took him out to our local club at Medred. And, that must um, have been a shock for no, him. This is a ghost. Really this so. is actually a ghost that's with us. You now, took a ghost to a nightclub? Not no, a nightclub. It's, 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 it's a transport club. It's just a place where we... Uh, Social. A, rec Social. a recreation mm. place where we have a few drinks. Yeah. Now, when we walked in, there's only two of us knew that he was with us. Mm. Uh, we walked in the club. There's our friends sat there. They see us walking. They set out seven chairs. We go and sit down. There's only six of us. You got seven chairs had been placed. Did they say the seventh chairs for the... They didn't know he was there. <laughs> they looking. didn't know he was there. So, yeah. We just walked in uh -huh. and they automatically, for some reason, set out seven so, chairs. Yeah. yeah, there were two friends there, two friends there, and me and my other half, and our little friend the ghost. And what was, what was he saying to you about the club? Well, not a lot, really. He, what fascinated him were like when we took him on a, a bus. Um, it were like... We took him out of his world and we brought him into ours. He can now see our world. And so he's fascinated by all the things, and any kid would do. He sees things for the first time, we take him on a bus. What was he saying, was he asking? Well, like, we, we got him up and he stood there outside. I could see him, stood outside at the driver, looking at all controls. He suddenly turned around and sees all these people up. All these people, they can't see me. I says, no, because you're dead. He says, I'm what? I don't, I don't know what you mean. I said, you're invisible. I'm invisible? Oh, I like being invisible. A little 12-year-old kid does. But he didn't realise he were dead. And it, we, over a period of about four or five weeks... He must weeks, have got an inkling. He did, because we had to teach him that he was dead. And eventually, his sister come for him. And um, his sister come, and she says, will you come with me? And as he walked forward... He left all his deformities behind. He's, he had an unch back. He was basically a little uh, Quasimodo. And yet, the first time we saw him, his face was shaded by A's. He wouldn't let us see his face. And when he eventually did, there were folds of skin and his mouth were all twisted. He just looked like a little bulldog. It was the only way, a human bulldog is the only way I can describe him. And as he walked towards his sister and into the light, he left all his deformities behind and he became a normal young person. And since his sister took him away, you've never seen him again? Uh, no, actually, he wouldn't go with his sister. He was absolutely terrified of his father. His mother died at childbirth, so therefore his father hated him. Plus he was deformed. His sister tried to look after him, hide him in woods. She fed him on what she could. And he virtually lived wild. When he did come into contact with his father, he used to beat him. If he wanted to kill him. But when his father did come back, she come through, he come through, since, and um, he knew that I was protecting the lad. I won't let him have him. 
there was so much hatred coming from the man that he actually had to come through my partner. Now, well, he actually walked through your partner? He virtually took her over. Part took her over. He come into her and they were like two people in one, sort of. But she allows this to go so far, she can do that. And uh, he's telling her things, you know, he says, well, I really, I love him. And all I can feel and all that can feel is this hatred. And she says, it wasn't hatred for him, for the lad, it was hatred for himself. Because since he'd passed on to the spirit world, he realised what he'd done. He realised what he'd done that were wrong. And his dad put his arm out to him and he were coming to him as if somebody would a wild animal. Very, very slowly. And he's cringing back and he's saying, shall I go? I said, it's up to you. I said, just touch his hand. And as their hands touched, then we could feel the love that would come from both of them. And uh, <laughs> uh, since, uh, as they went, Synth actually burst into tears because she could feel the love of them both being joined together. And as they walked away, they were, I could see the man holding the little lads and the little lad skipping away merrily. They disappeared into the light. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to WOW Presents!